sermon is entitled Christmas or Bust. <laughs> Christmas or Bust. And we've been going through a preaching series called The Story of Christmas, and we've looked at all these different characters. We've looked at Mary and Joseph, of course. We looked at Elizabeth and Zechariah. Last night, I hope you, if you were here, we, we looked at God himself writing himself into the story. The author of life becomes one of the characters in Christ Jesus. Well, today as we wrap up this Advent preaching series, and then next week we have a special message on January 1st on the launching into the New Year's, and then we'll go back into Hebrews chapter 11 on the faith series. But I want to look at the wise men to put a bow on this series, if you will, because the wise men often are just shown in our nativity set as kind of there at the manger, right, at the stable. They kind of converge with the shepherds. But historically speaking, that is not true. <laughs> they get there a little bit later. Now it's nice that we can pull all the characters into the same nativity. But they are afterwards, when Jesus is a young child, that they are on their way to discover him. And so they are part of our Christmas story, but it, it's a great bookend to bring them at the tail end of the story. And so that's that's why I've chosen them today. And I've called it Christmas or bust because these men are resolved. They are resolved to get to Jesus no matter what. They don't even know who he is. But through a prophecies in the Old Testament, they discover that following the star will lead them to the Messiah, will lead them to the King of the Jews. And so I'm going to pray for us and then break into this short preaching series or message really on Christmas or bust. So let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the story of Christmas. We thank you for all the various characters whose lives, as we said earlier, were interrupted, Lord, and interruptible to prepare for Christ. And we thank you that now here in 2022, as we come to worship you, Jesus, on this Christmas morning, we pray once again that you would interrupt our lives, interrupt our Christmas morning, and speak to us through your holy word. Lord, we thank you for the resolve of these these wise men, as they made their way to Jesus. And we pray that we would still seek him today, no matter what. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you're unfamiliar, kids, with the phrase blank or bust, I want to explain this at the outset of the sermon. This is a phrase that basically means, and I got this off of freedictionary.com, an idiom, an expression used to indicate that someone will not stop trying until they arrive at a certain place or achieve a certain goal. Think like a bumper sticker saying blank or bust. And I have a few examples to put on the screen. First, this one's an example back in 2016. You remember the Bernie or bust, not to get too political in church, but this was somebody, kids, who was running for president, and a certain crowd says, we're all in on him no matter what. It was a bust. <laughs> but they were Bernie or bust. They were going to vote for him and try to get him or die trying. No matter what, we are with Bernie. Here's one, college bound. Oh, Florida or bus. There we go. I'm skipping around. The Florida or bus. In fact, after church today, folks are asking, what are you guys doing for Christmas? My family, we're actually hopping into our minivan and we're driving to Florida. So yeah, we're going to get away for the week. We're from Florida for seven and a half years, so my parents are up here. They let us use their condos. We're Florida or bust, all right? We're going to get there or die trying, all right? Florida or bust. Go ahead to the next one. I don't even know what this one means, but it was funny. Burrito or bust. <laughs> it conjures up all sorts of imagery in the mind that you can just tuck away for later. So how about this one? King Jesus or bust. Because here we see in the Christmas story, these individuals, they're not even Jewish, so it's so provocative, and there's lots of things in our Bibles where you say, I just wish I knew a little bit more. Now, there are a lot of legends and oral traditions about these characters. Some traditions have as three because of the three gifts. But uh, in the Eastern Church, they actually believe that there are 12 kings from the East that came. And there's a lot of prophecies in the Old Testament that talk about it, but these these other characters, these magi, these wise men travel hundreds if not thousands of miles for weeks if not months to come and discover the Messiah, the King of the Jews. And they will get there no matter what. Which is why I've entitled today's brief message, Christmas or Bust. Because if these outsiders, if these people who aren't even part of God's family will do anything to get to see the King of the Jews, what does it speak about our own lives and pursuing Jesus no matter what. What can we learn from their journey and from their lives? Three brief points. To offer King Jesus your greatest, because they offer him their greatest. This is how we celebrate Christmas or bust. We offer King Jesus your greatest joy, no matter your journey. 
worship no matter your rank, and gifts no matter your resources. So let's look at this first one. To offer King Jesus your greatest joy no matter your journey. Look at verses 8, 9, and 10 again on the screen or in your Bibles. Well, it says here, after he sent them to Bethlehem. Now remember from the great, uh, Teo did a great job of reading, that they went to Herod first, and he said, go find this child. He says, after he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. And after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. Verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Again, when they saw the star rest over the place in Bethlehem, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. For Christmas or bust, how do we celebrate Christmas no matter what? Offer King Jesus your greatest joy no matter your journey. Now, I've already said this. These characters, they blow me away. I mean, sometimes we struggle to wake up on time for church, right? Sometimes we struggle to get the kids in the car and uh, my wife is amazing, so I, I'm not going to dump on any mommy guilt right now because she does a great job to get here. But it, so I have the benefit of just scooping into church. But it is hard. It is hard to get to church. It is hard to worship. These individuals, when they see the star in their own homeland, now they're called magi, so they know not only their own scriptures, but obviously the Jewish scriptures, and they, they realize this is a symbol, this is a sign, this represents the fulfillment of the prophecies to Israel, and they allow their lives to be interrupted, and they travel for weeks, if not months, together to go and to find the Christ child. And i got to imagine, now this is where my imagination kicks into full steam, in the ancient Near East, in the Middle East, in this desert land, right, and we have... Traditions where they're on donkey or they're on camelback and so forth. What a difficult journey that would have been. I mean, what a what a far precarious journey that would be to. And they make it, they go straight to where you would think a king would be born, right? They go to Jerusalem, which is basically the capital, where the temple is, but also where King Herod has been installed as basically this kind of regent king. He's sort of quasi-Jewish but also represents the Roman authorities. And they go to him first, and they say, well, where is he? Where is who? <laughs> well, you know, he who's been born king of the Jews. Now, if you wonder why King Herod's feeling threatened in that moment, you don't have to have a huge imagination at that point, right? And at the end, we see Herod on a tyrannical uh, rampage to kill all the childs born in Bethlehem, two years and younger. So he just does a, a full sweep just to make sure he covers his bases. So they're in a precarious spot when they go in there and like, oh, <laughs> you're not excited about this? And Herod doesn't really know his Bible, so he has to get the Bible scholars in there, like, go to Bethlehem. And so he says, go and search diligently until you found that child, and then let me know where he is. Wink, wink, nod, nod. They have quite a precarious and difficult journey, and then they get caught in the middle of a, a religious political debates and tensions that they didn't come prepared for, right? They were just coming to offer their gifts and to celebrate this. And all of a sudden, there are now, not only is this child threatened, not only have they kind of flagged it for the powers that be, but now their own lives are threatened. Will they become complicit? Will they go back to Herod and become informants and disclose all of this? They're trapped in the middle of all of this, but what do they do? They still follow that star, and when they finally find Jesus, it's not like they, they throw their gifts and run away, like, here, we, we brought these for you, and let's bow out of here. No. They rejoice exceedingly, we are told, with great joy. Even though this journey did not go according to their plans, they thought they'd come with all pomp into Jerusalem with their gifts, and everyone's with great fanfare, like, all the nations are coming to celebrate with us. Didn't go down that way. By the end, they are slinking out the back door, running for their lives. But here's what I want you to see in the Christmas story. It doesn't rob them of the joy of encountering Jesus in that moment. It doesn't rob them of the exceeding joy despite their journey of what they had to go through both to get to Jesus and then to run from that moment away. 
in that moment, they would experience joy no matter their journey. And I think it's provocative for us on Christmas because we all know that Christmas can be a season of great joy, but also of great pain. In fact, one of the reasons, full disclosure, I would never want to cancel church on Christmas Day is because I realize that Christmas can be a time for family to get together, but it can also be a time of great loneliness, right? Where you're more aware of who's not in the room with you. Or maybe you've been widowed and now you're alone and your children have scattered. And Christmas becomes a time where you're just feeling more pain than joy. Well, first, I want to say that the church is a family, amen, and that we are here for each other. And that's why I want to be together on Christmas Day so that we would worship him together and experience the joy of Christ. But here's my point is we can still experience joy in Jesus Christ even when the journey doesn't go according to our plans, amen? That's what the wise men show us is that the exceeding joy of Christ and the story of Christmas trumps all the other turmoil that they had to walk through in this life, even because of Jesus. It wasn't just that Jesus actually was on the side here and they had turmoil. It's because of their, their pursuit of Christ that they entered into this perilous journey. And yet they still had exceeding joy, overwhelming joy, great joy in the Christmas, in the Christ child. My question for you this Christmas is, despite the pain that you've experienced in your life, would you allow Jesus to break in and bring exceeding joy to you like these wise men? I see them and I see heroes of the faith that I barely even know. But the joy of God floods their hearts because of the joy of Jesus Christ. I would also say under this first point before we move on to the second one, Jesus models this for us through the Christmas story as well. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. We don't often think of the suffering of Christ and the joy of Christ, how they converge, but that is the mystery of the faith that we believe in, right? Is that joy has come through suffering. And our, our joy in Christ and our joy in heaven and our joy, even the pain in this world is preparing you for an eternal weight of glory and joy on the other side. Don't waste your pain. Don't waste your suffering. And allow it to even be the very seeds that give birth to joy in your life. Amen? Offer King Jesus your greatest joy no matter your journey. Secondly, offer King Jesus your greatest worship no matter your rank. Worship no matter your rank. Oh, by the way, let me circle back to this last point, first point for a second. David Bashnick, where are you? All right, David Bashnick in the back here. I was saying a little bit earlier that some folks maybe on Christmas Day don't have somebody to be with this day. David has offered, he's cooking for about four people, he said. If you don't have a place to go after church, David would like to open up his home to you so that you could have a place to worship or a place to have fellowship and community afterwards on Christmas Day. So please don't let that pass you by. By the way, is there anybody else that was hoping to open up your house? I didn't, I'm just doing this spontaneous, but raise your hand. Is there anybody else available to host some people? All right, David, you get them all. Now, David did say he might have 30 people coming over. So <laughs> if you do, you can have the fellowship hall. But I'm just saying, thank you, David, for doing that. We thank God for you. Can we thank David for opening up his home today? <laughs> Offer King Jesus, secondly, your greatest worship, no matter your rank. Verse 11, it says, And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary and his mother, and they fell down, and they worshipped him. Now, this is quite a scene, isn't it? This tradition where we call him we three kings. Again, we don't know if there were three, if there were 12. They have three gifts. Uh, but they were clearly high-ranked, very educated individuals. They were, in the Greek, they're magi. So these are either, that's why we call them these wise men. And it's possible because the prophecies in the Old Testament talk about the, the king's from the east coming, you can look these up later. For example, Isaiah chapter 60 has kings from the east bringing gold and frankincense. In Psalm 72 verse 11, kings fall down before him to worship him. So it appears that these are the prophecies these individuals are fulfilling, the kings falling down to worship him. But either way, whether they are kings, magi, wise men, these are individuals of high rank. And by the way, we know it because their, their gifts are very expensive, right? 
And so these are individuals, you don't just scrape up gold on the side of the street, all right? These are individuals that have a lot of wealth. These are individuals that can walk into a castle, namely like King Herod's palace, and actually get to talk to the king, right? I mean, it's not like somebody off the street's just like, hey, can I get a moment with King Herod? Sure, come on right on in, right? These are some high and powerful individuals, and they follow this star, as we saw, and they, they rejoice exceedingly. So joy fills their heart when they discover where Jesus is. But then what do they do when they see the Christ child? They bow down before the child. And they worship him. Now this is quite an image, isn't it? These individuals in their great garb, with their gold and frankincense, possibly with their crowns, walking into this, they're probably not in the stable anymore. I don't know where they are at this point in Bethlehem, but they're in some room. They're in a place. I'm sure it's very meager. I mean, if Jesus was born into a feeding trough, I don't think they're now staying at, you know, a five-star resort at this point. And these great wealthy individuals bow down before a child with his impoverished parents, one of whom is a carpenter, right? And they worship their child in that place in this little town of Bethlehem. They are not embarrassed. They're not too important. They're not too sophisticated. They're not too educated. They're not too fill in the blank to get down on their knees, on their face, and worship who this child is to worship King Jesus. And once again, that's provocative, isn't it? Because sometimes we could even come to church around a bunch of Christians and be a little self-conscious of our worship, and here they are going into Bethlehem, into this little town, into this little room, and bowing before a child, before most of the people in that town even know who this child is. They are bowing before King Jesus. And to Celebrate a Christmas or bust. Here's what I want to challenge us with their example is to worship Jesus no matter your rank. You are not too important, all right? You are not to fill in the blank. Put your pride away. Put your pride aside and give yourself fully to King Jesus. I think of King David in the Old Testament where he just looked ridiculous at times when he was out worshiping the Lord. He says, I'm going to even get crazier than this. He was jumping, rejoicing, celebrating. He laid it all out there for the Lord. That is what worship is. It's pouring out all of ourselves to God. And this Christmas, if we want to go Christmas or bust, let's worship Jesus no matter your rank. No matter whether you're high state, low estate. Everybody comes to Jesus to worship him and bow before him. Thirdly and finally, Christmas or bust, offer King Jesus your greatest gifts no matter your resources. Your greatest gifts no matter your resources. The, the, the end of verse 11, it says, after they fell down and worshiped him, then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Offer King Jesus your greatest gifts, no matter your resources. Now, I've already said these are precious gifts, right? We get gold, right? <laughs> gold is expensive today, and it was expensive back then. It's a commodity you can invest in today. You could back then. It holds a va its value, and it goes up in value. Frankincense and myrrh and these, these amazing spices that were very costly. In fact, when Jesus was buried and wrapped in that garment at the end, he was also placed with spices. Myrrh was one of those costly spices. And Joseph of Arimathea gives his costly tomb to him. So right at the very outset these gifts are offered, we have a hint not only of his kingly ship, like gold, like crowns and the, the gold of a king, but also a symbol of his death, foreshadowing the one day that he would die for our sins, the very spice that he's wrapped in. But I just see here once again that these wealthy individuals, they divest themselves of some of this wealth with nothing in return, right? It's not like they're going to get the tax deduction at the end of the year. That, by the way, we all enjoy, right? They're not doing this because they're Jewish and they're pouring it into the temple. And by the, by the way, at the end, that, that gold, they get to go worship in the temple and see the gold. They weren't doing it because... And, 
God bless all the people who paid for this building and got plaques with their names on it, right? They weren't doing it for a plaque. Now, praise God, it's been remembered here for us, but they were just doing it because they loved this Christ child. They worshiped him. They wanted to show their devotion to him. They offer King Jesus your greatest gifts, no matter your resources. And that's provocative for me and for us as believers because, again, they're not part of the church, but they are still giving generously to the king of the church. Now, you might be thinking, well, Pastor, that's easy if you're a king, right? That's easy if you're rich. If I had lots of gold, too, then I'd give all my gold to Jesus as well. But did you know that study after study reveals that the wealthier you are, especially as Americans, the less generous you become? That there's an inverse relationship between our wealth and our generosity. I mean, American Christians, sadly, we give more to our pets, numerically speaking, than we do to global missions. Not a good, right? There's very few Christians who even tithe, even which I think is the Old Testament baseline, right? And so I would challenge us by their example. No matter our resources, what will you give to King Jesus? Will you allow that to stir your heart to a life of generosity? Jesus uses the story where all these wealthy individuals are coming to the temple to drop their money in the offering box. You guys remember the story, right? And they're giving their great sums, and they're tithing down to, you know, he's, he commends them down to their mints and down to their garden uh, spices and so forth. He says, yeah, yeah, you guys are doing that great job. But then this woman comes in, and she puts in two copper coins, very small, like basically two pennies. And Jesus sees her says, you see that woman? She put in more than all of these other wealthy individuals because they put a tenth of what they have. You know, God gives 100%. They gave 10% back. Great. She put in 100%. She put in all she has to live on. That is a life lived by faith. Now, I don't want to tell you, therefore, at the end of the year, just give, you know, you made 50 this year, put, give 50 to Jesus. But I would say this. Let it stir you to say, what does it look like to live sacrificially for Jesus? And I didn't really plan this sermon. I, I, I just picked preaching series uh, based upon, you know, I picked the text. And as I got there and I meditated on this, I thought this is an appropriate way to end not only the Christmas series, but also the year because many people are praying about what to give to nonprofits and churches before the year ends. And if you're watching online as well, I allow you to stir what would... What would it look like to bring my gold, my frankincense, my myrrh, or my two pennies to King Jesus this year, and every year, by the way? And as believers, the reason we give our all to King Jesus is because he gave his all for us. Amen? We're not asking, you know, hey, God is a stingy God, but give to him anyway. No, God gives everything to you. I worshiped at this... Uh, Black Pentecostal Church the other week. You guys remember where I was preaching over in, in Havertown? And when they did the offering, it was very provocative. The pastor's wife got up there, and she said, Church, God asked us to give back to him, but he first gives to us. He gives 100%, 100% before he asks us to return the 10% to him. He provides it all. I thought, wow, what, a, what an example of faith to remember that God has given 100% to you both in your salvation, but also everything in your bank accounts. God put it there. Your house, that roof over your head, God has given it to you. And so what could we give to King Jesus this Christmas? And I was also thinking about this, as, even as it just drove up this morning. You know, Mary and Joseph have a tough journey ahead, right? Because King Herod's going to chase them down. Joseph's warned in a dream to flee. And so they leave, right? They go to Egypt. The wise men, they have to flee as well. I bet you they burn through that gold, <laughs> that frankincense, and that myrrh in that journey. We don't know, but Jesus doesn't have a lot of money towards the end of his life, right? So he's not sitting on piles of gold throughout his ministry and just throwing gold coins around. This is not who he is. The money that was given to Jesus was preparation for the challenges ahead. And I'm not prophesying right now, but I was thinking about Manoah and the journey that we have ahead as a church. And this has been an incredible year for us as a church. I'm not, this is not rebuke in any way. This church has given heroically. 
But I do believe that God is preparing us for things, including we've already talked about purchasing back this building. There's a boiler that's about to go. That these things were given not so that we'll sit on piles of gold, right, but because there is a perilous journey ahead, but they come out of it successful because of the investment of these individuals in King Jesus' life. And I believe that God has a similar journey for us. We are at a tipping point as a church, and we are launching from this point into great strength as a congregation into 2020, 2023, and beyond. But humanly speaking, God is using each one of you to prepare us for that journey ahead. And I have a dream for us as a church as we wrap up not only the Christmas preaching series, but also this year. I believe that Jesus wants us not only to buy back this building for the glory of God, but I believe one day he wants us to figure out how to do that all over this region. That one day we would be planting and revitalizing churches all over greater Philadelphia. I've said to the elders, once we figure out how to do this, I want to learn how to rinse, wash, and repeat, right? That maybe we would build a relationship with this denomination and say, okay, what next building can we get from you? What next building can we get from you? And keep doing that over and over and over again. But it's going to take individuals like these three kings to say, Jesus or bust. I'm giving it all to King Jesus. My joy is found in Christ. And the greatest gift of all he's given me is the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. And because of that, it spurs me on to a life of generosity where I give heroically to the cause of Christ so that the mission of Jesus Christ could be advanced to the very ends of the earth. They are making a deposit in the protection of King Jesus to take his message to the ends of the world. May we be found faithful doing the same for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Let's stand.